Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Mark Kawakami, who works on the best sports site in the world, Yahoo Sports, talking about touch for sports. All right. Uh, as I said, I'm Mark Kawakami. Uh, I work for the Fantasy uh, Sports. I've worked here since pretty much all the history that Dave Glass was talking about. I've been here for that. That's not actually true, but I've been here since 2007. And today I'm talking about, uh, the talk is titled, Touch Football, Rebuilding Yahoo Fantasy Football for the Modern Web. And any of you have seen my previous YOYConf talk, you'll think that I'm giving the exact same talk, because that was also about rebuilding Yahoo Fantasy Football for the modern web, and specifically focusing on touch devices. I promise you this is different, but yes, if I have the reputation of being the fast and furious franchise of tech conference speakers, I think that's fair. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to be covering, I'm going to go over the goals of what we wanted to do with this year's fantasy football. Lots of changes. I can't cover them all, but I'll cover the stuff that uh, I was closely involved with. Uh, then we're going to talk about some of how we did specifically uh, how we did it. You, lots of use of delegating, taps. I'm going to have a little confession to make. Then we're going to talk about keyboard accessibility because it's really, really important. And then after that, I'm going to go insane, and I'm going to put the question to you, what's better, a rave versus a, or a clown sock? Which should you choose? And there's a correct answer, or there is if you're insane. And then after that, there will be questions, which, given that I will go insane in number four, there might be a lot of questions. All right. So what were we trying to do when we were trying to do fantasy football for this year? Well, from my perspective, from the perspective of the interaction, we want an interaction for our drag and drop roster, or for our rosters that works great on all three screens. And you might be saying, well, wait a second. That's what you talked about last time, making sure that the rosters worked on touch devices. And yeah, it's true, but what we had last time was that it works on touch devices. And I admitted this actually in my last presentation. I had a whole... Uh, uh, section of it called I Can Read Minds, sort of, and it was about all the complex things we had to do in order to get drag and drop working where we had to do different shapes between a regular scroll gesture and a dragging gesture, which involved a 25 millisecond pause, blah, blah, blah. But I ended it with this, the idea that you can reduce frustration with trying to figure out what the user is trying to do, but the better thing is to eliminate frustration with great UI. And so that's what we tried to do this year. We tried to create the great UI that actually really fit in touch devices rather than simply trying to emulate the regular desktop experience. Because ESP is for chumps. You shouldn't do it. Don't try to read the user's mind. Try to present them an interface that works well for them. So basically the idea is we want to go from it works on touch devices to it works. So here's what we came up with. Uh, this one is Firefox. This one is Chrome. There we go. Got to make sure I don't use one of my real leagues here. Let's make this bigger for you. OK. So before, you used to be able to drag these things around, which is great on a desktop where you, the drag gesture is very different from scrolling because you're going to be using entirely different buttons for it. You use the scroll wheel or page up or page down. But on touch devices, uh, scrolling and dragging are the same. So we wanted something where we could differentiate. So we have a tap gesture, which highlights what's available, and you just tap again, and you get, you can basically move things that way. And this is, this works great because, uh, because it's very easy to differentiate between a tap and between an actual scroll. So there's no confusion about it. And the only confusion really came about from people who were so used to drag and drop that when they came to this, even though we threw up a little helpful thing, but people don't read help text, they all wanted to drag. And they, they were like, ah, it doesn't work, until they figured out that all they had to do was just tap on the row or a click on the row, and it would, it would move around. Uh, and we had a few alternatives when we were working on this, and there's other things that we uh, are likely to um, bring up. Let's see. So we had, uh, uh, we had uh, what we're doing right now. That, that's, this is the prototype that we built in order to make these things, uh, in order to evaluate, oops. Uh, in order to evaluate uh, the different uh, um, the, the the different ways, but we also came up with another uh, idea that we had called uh, tap and place, which is where your options just show up right below, 
And uh, so we experimented with a whole bunch of options. And this is one of the cool things you can do with YOI because switching between these options is just a single attribute change. Um, I'm not going to show you the code for that because we're going to move on to other things. But the most important thing that we got out of this, that I didn't even quite realize we'd get out of this, was that we now have a roster that's, that is available so much faster. Like basically, it's available as soon as the page loads. Uh, um, so if we just do a full page reload, I mean, the roster is available to, be, to use, uh, available to work the moment the page is available. And that's partially from getting away from drag and drop. One of the things we saw is that drag and drop is fantastic. And for drags, you can create a drags really fast because you can delegate them. But you have to create the drops individually. That takes time. We also are doing a lot of work behind the scenes. But now we do things. Uh, 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 what we do now is we are able to get this thing to, sh to show up basically instantly. And there's a few ways we're doing that. The most important thing is that we delegate everything. You delegate basically every bit of code. You see we're delegating click events, key events. Uh, OK, we're going on a click outside, but you can't technically delegate that. We delegate animation end events. We delegate everything. And I really think that delegate, YY makes delegating so easy to do. And it works so well that that should be the default thing, that we should teach delegate first and then teach regular events, just to get, because you should never consider delegates to be something exotic or special. Delegates are how you should first look to assign any event handler. Does everybody here know what the delegate pattern is, by the way, in case we don't? We go into it really quickly, just in case you don't know. Basically, delegate uses event bumbling so that you can listen at a higher level. Like, say you want to attach event handlers to all the A tags inside of a list. And so you could go through and search for all the, uh, you could search for ULLIA that gives you all the A tags and attach an event handler to each of them. But that's really expensive. What delegate lets you do is basically essentially attach an event handler to the UL element and just listen for clicks to the A. And YUI makes it so easy that it's basically transparent. It one's just, just performs much better and is much faster than the other. So this means that we only have to attach a couple of event handlers when we initialize the roster instead of, uh, instead of uh, 30, 40, probably over 100 when you consider all the types of things we need to listen to. So that's one of the things we did. One of the other things we did was we started using tap events. And that's very important for, uh, for, iP uh, for iPads. This is, well, my background is so messy. I should have uh, should have thought about that before I uh, brought this up. Pretend you're not looking at the, my desktop. <laughs> Except that I discovered when I was working on this presentation that I had at one point set them from not being tap events to being regular click events. And that means uh, that I messed up. And luckily, this presentation came along. So the cool thing is we get to see the difference. Now, the difference between click is a normal click. Mouse click. We all know what a click is. You know, mouse down, mouse up. It's click, on click. Tap is something that YUI created. There's other terms for it in other libraries, fast click, things like that. But the issue is this. On touch devices, there's usually about a 500 millisecond delay between when you make a tap gesture, tap, and when it actually registers. And they do that because they need to listen to see whether or not it's going, there's going to be a double tap uh, to zoom in, whether or not that tap is going to turn into a dra Actually, it's mainly for the double tap that they're, that they're worried about. Because uh, the double tap has to be handled by the system, typically, because that's being that means zoom in, whereas the single tap is handled by the JavaScript or the web browser. And as a result, um, yeah, hold on a second. So uh, uh, as, as a result, yeah, I just want to make sure I was at the right place. So as a result, the, uh, um, the taps operate much faster. So let's see an example of how much faster that works. OK, please ignore my background. Oh. So, so I'm going to, when I say click, that's when I'm actually clicking, so, or tapping in this case. We're, this is the iOS simulator. So tap. Uh, no. Tap. Oof. That's tap. Oh, that's no good. 
So let's see what happens. Let's just go ahead and change this right here to tap. And then tap, boom, uh, tap, tap. Here, let's, let me make sure it still actually has the, it is, whoop. tap, yeah, tap, tap. I don't know if you can definitely see it based on how fast I'm saying tap, but it, uh, it actually, it reacts much, much, much sooner. And it really makes a difference. It, it, the difference between tap and click on a touch device, really, one just feels just a little old school mobile-ish because it's just old and it feels just like it, you've, like you, every single time you tap, if you're not using the tap event, it feels like the browser is going, wait, what? Okay, what? And, uh, and that's really not what you want. You want something that feels like it's eager to pay attention to you. So, as I said, basically, we're using the click event here, that is the click, but what you really want to do is tap, and the truth is, pretty much, there's very few places where you don't have to be just, where you, you can listen for tap a lot, rather than click, at sort of no cost, so you might want to even consider that more of a default, especially if you're going to be working with a lot of touch devices, and you will be working with a lot of touch devices. One of the most interesting facts I learned recently was that there's more people in this world who access the internet only with their smart only with a smartphone? That's their only access to the internet. There's more people that do that than people that use IE9. So, the smartphones, tab, touch devices, these are a core audience now, and you have to consider them. Anyways, the tap is way better. So the next thing we wanted to do is make sure it works for everyone. So I wanted to include really great keyboard accessibility in here. Now, the important thing about keyboard accessibility is that it is, keyboard accessibility, it basically means being able to operate your widget, your controls, whatever, from the keyboard. And it's very important for accessibility. As you're going to learn, there's an accessibility talk that happens uh, later in the day, which you should definitely see. But the important thing you need to know there is that keyboard accessibility is not everything there is to accessibility. It's a big part, but there's, accessibility should be easy. It's definitely something you need to think about. But it, Keyboard accessibility is an important part. And I'm really proud of what we came up here because, uh, whoop. so basically you can operate the entire thing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get into the roster. All right, so I, I can hit the down arrow to highlight different rows. And I can just hit return. Boom, that brings me into them. I can hit the down arrows and up arrows to, uh, Select, like if I want to bench somebody, down there, there, and then I can keep going down. I can also hit tab, the tab arrow one works, and if I don't want to uh, do any of these actions, I can escape out of them. So you have basically full keyboard control over the roster. And this is really easy to do. Uh, YUI has uh, good uh, keyboard event support. So let's see kind of how I did that. So here, this was the, uh, uh, and again, we're delegating, because we can delegate all these key events. And this, this is, um, basically, I'm saying we're listening for the key events. The key, that's just any key event is just called key. Our function handler is handle row key. But the important part is this. Enter 3840, tab, escape. These are the keys, in particular, that we're going to be listening for. So that means we're listening for the enter key. Uh, 38 and 40 are up and down. I don't need to list, worry about left and right. Tab is just the tab key. Escape is just the escape key. YUI is very nice where they don't, they don't force you to look up the key codes in this part of it to find out what, um, uh, to find out what the key codes are for these. You can just put in the equivalents. And then in the actual handler, there's obviously more to it than this, but this one is what we did to allow the user to escape out of the code. So e.keycode equals 27. That means if we're looking for the escape key, so, and then from there, we just do the same thing we do when we're getting out of our edit mode in the, in the other, um, in the non-keyboard interaction. So basically, I can just add this right on top of what we already built. I had already built the whole thing and then added keyboard accessibility, and I was able to do it in a half an hour, or not a half an hour, a half a day, an afternoon. So it was really easy to do, and that's probably one of the most important things you can do. 
So here's the fun part. After we launched this the, uh, fantasy football, when we, launched, we had such big changes this year. I don't know how many of you have seen it before. There are big changes, and obviously when you have big changes, you have lots and lots of complaints because people don't like it when you mess with their stuff and they think your website is theirs. You want them to think that. You want them to be that possessive of it. So that much kind of response is in some ways a good thing, but also it's in some ways a bad thing because people will tell you how stupid you are really creatively. It will happen a lot when you do a website with big changes. But the key about these is listening for what are real issues. And one of the things we ran into was all of a sudden people were complaining about scrolling on Firefox. And I have, by the way, set my dev box to have the same scrolling issue. And so we investigated it. Now I'm running on a MacBook with a retina display and a solid state drive and a really good graphics thing. I just wanted to tell you how cool my equipment is. There was no point to that. No. The point of that story is I'm working on really good equipment here. So it looks like the scrolling is pretty good here. And you have to remember that people are going to be operating on much worse devices. Their, their memory is going to be a lot more constrained. So just because it works well, it, it might not be. Now, I knew instantly what the problem was uh, that people were complaining about. Because I know this guideline about don't use fixed position backgrounds. You should never, ever use a fixed position background. And I, I knew this was true. And uh, here's how you can know about why you shouldn't use fixed position backgrounds. Ba basically, they force redraws. And you can prove that in Firefox. So here's our quiz. We're going to get into fixed position backgrounds in, the, in, a, in a second. But what's better? If you have clown socks, or if you have a rave, or none of the above. What I think it is. The correct answer is clown socks. Clown socks are better than raves. I'm about to show you why. By the way, I put it in a hashtag form because I really think you should tweet it out. You're going to have a lot of fun tweeting clown socks. No one will know what you're talking about. It'll be great. <laughs> so let's take a look. Firefox has a really, first of all, how many of you do this, where you're in Firefox and you want to inspect something with Firebug, and so you do inspect element, and you get Firefox's stupid web inspector rather than Firebug. How many of you do that and hate that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess what? I feel your pain. Firebug's way better, but Fire, the Firefox's built-in web inspector has something awesome. It has this little guy right down here. This shows paint rectangles. It's this little paintbrush thing. The uh, I don't know if you can read the... Uh, tool tip there, but it's, it says uh, uh, highlight painted area. And what it does is it shows you the area of the page that's been repainted. And here you can see, oh my god, we've got this crazy rave going on. And that's not what you want, is it? No, what you want is, <laughs> what, this is the one I like to use because there's no ads, there's nothing special on here. So this is the page I like to use to, to show this. Inspect on oh, the, oh wait, no, this is the one I wanted. What you want are these nice small paint rectangles down here. Even though they're going across the entire page, they're very easy and small to redraw. They basically, they look like clown socks is what I call them. That's what you want to see. You want to see clown socks. What you don't want to see is this crazy bump 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 and rave. <laughs> now, and this is the part where unfortunately sports.com, you see, Okay, uh, uh, go past that, go past that, clown socks. So that was the rave on fantasy football, and we had the same issue on fantasy sports, uh, or on regular sports. On the regular sports, that's the non-fantasy site. I blame, the, okay, except that now I can't really demonstrate it, or I thought we would have the same issue, but what happens was, okay, pretend this had a fixed position background behind it. This is important. They changed it. There's no fixed position background. It messes up my demo. They, they didn't consult me on this. I would have told them I had a presentation to give. They're all like, but the users. <laughs> Anyhow, but you'll notice that they've got nice clown socks here. And even when they had, when there was a fixed position background behind the, this stuff, and by the way, if, it if you get one big repaint, that's fine. What you don't want to see is the flashing. But when they had that, uh, I was getting nice clean clown socks and not a big rave here. 
And I couldn't figure that out. I was like, wait, wait what's going on here? How, is, this, is this just once again the regular sports site gets to have all the fun? That's not true. Fantasy gets to have all the fun. <laughs> because clearly, we've got our rave going here. And I dug into it deeper and deeper, and we just found out uh, that the issue is not using a fixed position background per se. It's that each of these modules has a different fixed position background than the one that's in the main background. We do that for readability. We have it be more blurry, blurrier is the correct term, blurrier, uh, less contrasty. We had done that to make it uh, easier to read rather than using like an RGBA color and some other tricks. And as it turns out, if you take that off and Right down here, we have the only reason uh, that you can see the rave on this, because obviously we fixed it, is because I insisted we keep this class name in uh, FUBAR so that I could give this presentation. So that changes it. It looks almost exactly the same. Uh, but now we're no longer using a fixed position background on the modules themselves. We're just using it on the background of, uh, uh, we're just using it on the background of the page and using an RGBA color. And so if we turn on rectangles, what do we get? We get our nice clean crown socks. So it's, it's basically the same effect, but we go, one has, one gives us a rave, and then, and then one gives us clown socks. And you can see the difference, actually, when you're scrolling around. You can see the difference just by, uh, if you, it's a little bit hard to see if you're not looking directly at a screen. But the scrolling here is much smoother when we're in, in clown socks mode. And if we go and we turn on rave mode, the scrolling just by, you can see it's a little bit jumpier. And again, I'm on a, a uh, I'm on a great device here. The difference on other machines is, is pretty radical. So the guideline here is use fixed position backgrounds. The truth is the guideline is don't follow guidelines. Browsers give you so many tools now to measure and, and see what uh, you can use. There's other tools like the uh, frames per second meter on Chrome. I'm going to walk you through a couple of these. So, in the preferences, in the, in the uh, Chrome's uh, developer tools, they have, uh, um, the, most of the action comes down rendering. So you can turn on showing paint rectangles. The rectangles show what is repainted. Uh, even though it appears to be repainting the whole page, don't, don't be fooled. Um, you can also turn on, there's the show FPS meter. That gives you this great frames per second meter up here. It tells you how many frames it's redrawing at. Right now it's redrawing in between 30 and 60. You don't want to really drop below 30. Ideally, you want to be up at 60. It has a little uh, gray bar to show you 60. It shows a histogram of how often you're hitting what. Uh, it ha there is also enable continuous page repainting. That's where it's constantly repainting the page, but that lets you find out what differences there are in, in, ver in the, uh, uh, um, this lets you find the differences for um, ba basically every single frame it will repaint the entire page and you can see how long it takes to see if you have paint problems in general. So you know, it's the, the average paint times here, they're coming in at uh, uh, between uh, 9 15 milliseconds. Let's turn on Let's turn on rave mode, and when we're scrolling, okay, you know what, Chrome's really good, so sometimes, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Let me just totally sure. okay, Chrome, Chrome always messes me up when I do these demos. I swear to God, Chrome is genuinely working harder here. It's really, but it's not, the effect isn't as severe as it is in Firefox. But there, there, the, you can see differences. Like you'll make one little class change or turn off one little style and all of a sudden your page repaints will be down. So that's a, a great tool. Oh. So the frame, frame profiling, that's when you uh, take a uh, timeline. This is actually another great one. I'm going to do it. If you go into the timeline panel, you hit record. The, uh, and just you know, do some stuff. 
you, you, it'll show you things like your events, your memory profile, but it'll also show you each frame, each little, each little bar, upwards bar here, is, a, is an individual frame. This little gray line is the 60 frames per second and then the 30 frames per second. So if you have a lot of things coming in below this, this gray bar here, that means you're hitting a solid 60 frames per second. If you have a lot of things coming up to the top here, you're hitting 30 frames per second. If both of these bars are sort of way down, then you're going to be at a, um, that means you're hitting well below 30 frames per second. You want to fix it. Um, so this is a really useful thing because you can examine sort of each individual frame, uh, each individual redraw frame and see what was going on. And it's, oh, I, I, okay, you've probably already seen. There is a secret Firefox frames per second meter. For a long time I was like, oh, I only wish Firefox could show me frames per second the way Chrome does. And, there, and as it turns out, there actually is one. They built in, they haven't told you about, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about it, and you can impress all your friends. Basically, you go into about config. About config is where all the secret configs are in Firefox. I hope you all know that. And just look for FPS. And there's draw FPS. Layers.acceleration.draw FPS. It's a Boolean. All you have to do, double click it, and it'll put this very ugly frames per second meter up here. So, going back to the clown socks demo, in which mode are we in? I forgot. We are in, oh, we are in rave mode. Okay. So you can see, look at these frames per second up here. We're coming in, never, you've never seen that peak above 30, right? Let's go and let's put ourselves into clown socks. And then boom, we're getting up here. We're getting up to the 30, 60. We're very rarely going below 30, and we're usually up between 50 and 60. So, so, which brings me to restate the points. Uh, we got to go past these guys again. Don't follow guidelines. Follow measurements. Wherever you can, when you're doing performance profiling, just measure rather than following these rules of thumb. Because we always used to have these rules of thumbs because the browsers didn't let us see what they were doing. So they'd be like, oh, don't do this or that. I don't even remember. But basically, the browser tools, even IE11 is doing amazing things. By the way, I want to ma mention that we are very much hiring. I work on a great team. I love the people I work with, and we're always looking to add more people. Uh, so if you can come talk to me, or if you want, you can email. I should have put my email address on here. It's a, uh, uh, well, OK, anyways, but uh, um, here. <laughs> No, 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 I want the credit. Mark K at yahooinc.com. <laughs> or sports jobs at Yahoo Inc. Actually, no, sports jobs is actually a better one. But we are absolutely very much hiring. This is the best team I've ever worked on in my life. I love it. So, and I'd love for you guys to join us, especially if you're interested in sports at all, fantasy sports, anything. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple minutes for questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> And by the way, there are flyers out front that also have more information about sports jobs. All right, so Mark, you're talking about delegating and how it helps with the, um, the event handling performance system. Mm -hmm. At what point do you draw a line between delegating? For example, you mentioned the UL LI A delegate, so you put the event handler on the UL and then just listen for when it hits an A. When does that start becoming more of a hindrance than a help? For example, if you put the event handler on the body element and then just listen for all the clicks within the page, like, at what point do you draw that line and say, all right, we are doing too much filtering based on what it's clicking versus adding more event handlers? Uh, I wouldn't say I know the answer to that specifically. I would say, in general, put it at whatever the, most logi the, the, the lowest logical module is so that it doesn't have to verse up and you don't have situations where you're having to differentiate between these things, but it's going to match against the selector. The truth is, I think even if you do that, if you were to put everything on the body and delegate from there, don't do that because that's lazy, but if you were to do that, that's probably still better than attaching individual event handlers to every little thing. But this is a balancing act. You know, If you're going to be attaching a body delegate and there's only ever going to be this one element that's going to be receiving like that click event or something like that, and you're doing that a hundred times, you're really attaching a hundred event listeners to the body element when you didn't have to, and they could have been on other elements. So maybe it's a little bit better, but in general, but that's an unusual case. I mean, I can't think of when you would ever, well, 
Uh, I can't think of when you would do that in general. But right now in fantasy, we've got several body uh, delegates, and I don't see any performance issue with them there. Um, I mean, there's limits to everything, but in general, going, switching away from delegates for the sake of performance is usually not a sentence you will have to consider saying ever. Anyone else? Oh, all people I know. So on your uh, uh, top versus click, um, you said that generally tap is better than click because you essentially get it for free, but when do you not want to use tap? You don't want to use tap, first of all, if you want to allow people to do the double tap to zoom in, for instance, if you don't want that to be disabled, you pretty much have to use a click there. Uh, you don't want to use, if there was something you knew would only ever be used in a desktop, I suppose you wouldn't necessarily want to. For the most part, I'd say you kind of want to use tap more, but you, it's not as clear cut as delegate because there is a cost. You have the cost of losing the double tap. If, 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 your, web, if your web view has those meta tags that basically prevent zooming at all, uh, I, I honestly think there's, you, there's no reason why the browser should even consider having the 500 millisecond delay at that point, because the only thing you could mean by clicking on it is a, is a click event and not a double tap to zoom in, because you can zoom in. So I think the, browser should, the uh, uh, mobile browser should disable it then, but that's sort of beside the point. But the point is, that's the main case. And the truth is, that can happen a lot, especially if you don't have a, a solid mobile view. So also, um, uh, if you do a delegate uh, for a click on a button, um, it also uh, registers events uh, when you like enter or spacebar on the button. If you change that to a tap, would it still work? Would the keyboard event still work? Uh, pretty much, yeah. The I mean, okay. I'm going to take a rough. I, I'm pretty sure it does. I don't actually, this fact isn't solidly embedded in my brain. But for desktop browsers, tap and click are, are equivalent. Yeah, all it does is really changes what happens in the touch of available browsers. Is that, I'm getting a nod from Jenny, and Jenny would know. So. Uh, Tilo is your expert on Tilo, this. by the way, is your expert on this. <laughs> he gave a talk yesterday. He gave a talk about this yesterday. It was ex actually, it was an excellent talk. All right, thanks, Mark. All right, thank you.